Monsters is a podcast about the worst human beings on the planet. The episodes of this podcast deal with murder, dismemberment, torture, rape, child abuse, and mental illness. Please turn back while you still can. Listener discretion advised. Samantha Keymatch spent the five short years of her daughter, Phoenix Sinclair's life, treating her like she was nothing but garbage. She was bounced around between foster homes and family members before finally going to live permanently with her mother and her mother's boyfriend, Carl McKay. Once there, the couple verbally abused her, locked her in the cold basement, starved her, and ultimately beat the girl to death. They then disposed of the body near a landfill and continued reporting her as a dependent in order to receive more welfare. This is Monsters. Come back and find out that he's deceased. Tap me on the head, tell me I'm cheating, tell me I'm, you know, let me see your phone. Just kill her and she dies. I think Diego Campione is totally in the wrong and I hope he burns in hell for all his sins. Hell is not a very fun place. I only have two hands. I'm on that whole hand girl. I'm two hands. And her nose just get escalated and escalated. <laughs> In this season, which focuses on filicide, this story is an example of fatal maltreatment filicide. This poor girl was abused by both her mother and her mother's boyfriend. Eventually, the abuse killed her even though that's not what they were trying to do. It also has some elements of unwanted child filicide. Phoenix Sinclair's mother had absolutely no desire to actually take care of her daughter. She wanted custody of Phoenix so she could get more welfare, and when the child died, Police say she showed no emotion whatsoever. The child was nothing to her. This is unfortunately too common. Murder is the third leading cause of death in children ages 1 to 4, and the fourth leading cause of death in children ages 5 to 9. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, parents are responsible for 80.1% of child deaths caused by neglect or child abuse. CNN reports that on average, about 500 children are killed by one or both of their parents every year in the United States. A parent murdering a child has been happening for a long time, though. In the Roman Empire, a father was allowed to kill his own children. Children were regularly killed or exiled for their wrongdoings. In the 16th century, laws against killing your children were changed, especially in Europe. By the 17th century, both France and England had laws against filicide, and it was punishable by death. These laws actually established the mother as being guilty until she proved that she hadn't murdered her children. Studies have shown that mothers and fathers are pretty equally responsible for killing their children, but mothers are more likely to kill a daughter, where fathers are more likely to kill a son. When police and social workers arrived at the house of Samantha Keymatch and Carl McKay to check on the welfare of five-year-old Phoenix Sinclair, Keymatch produced a young girl and claimed it was Phoenix. The authorities knew it wasn't the girl they were inquiring about. When Keymatch couldn't produce Phoenix, she was placed under arrest. Phoenix Sinclair was born on April 23, 2000, to Samantha Keymatch and Steve Sinclair. Both of the parents had children previously that were taken by Child and Family Services, CFS. Keymatch was taken into the Cree Nation Child and Family Caring Agency, CFCA, in 1993, when she was 11 years old. Her mother was a heavy drinker who had frequent parties. After her conviction, Samantha Keymatch was interviewed by Mike McIntyre of the Canadian Free Press, where she briefly discussed her childhood. And so you didn't grow up in care or anything, right? Like I grew up in care right until I was 18. So you were taken away from your mom? Um, yeah, a few times I was taken away from her. And then... What was the problem? Was she... I guess... Did she drink? Alcohol, I guess. Was she an alcoholic? Um... I guess she was an alcoholic, from what I... Right. ...remember. So did you and your your brothers grow up in the same sort of foster home, or were you put all over? Um... Just me and my third oldest brother, Martin. we were... Mickey. Or sorry, Mickey. We were together. When they refer to care, they're talking about being raised in the foster system. When Keymatch was 16 years old, she had her first child who was taken away and put into CFCA. Samantha met Steve Sinclair in 1998, and they quickly moved in together. By 1999, Keymatch had become pregnant. 
Staff at the Boys and Girls Club, where the couple regularly hung out, said that they noticed that Samantha had gained weight, had an increased appetite, and started wearing her coat inside. They suspected that she was trying to hide a pregnancy, but never had any confirmation until Phoenix was born in April of 2000. While Keymatch was still in the hospital, a nurse sent a note to the hospital's social worker. It's being read here by someone for the podcast. Please assess. Patient, 19 years old. Patient is having her second baby. Patient's first child is a permanent ward of CNFS. Patient had no prenatal care with this pregnancy. Patient on welfare. Lives common law with baby's father. The social worker met with Samantha, who wrote these notes in Keymatch's file. Keep in mind that social workers refer to themselves as the writer in their reports. Writer met with Samantha to review above concerns. Samantha advised that her son, two years, was made a permanent ward of CFS because they thought I would hurt him. Samantha advised that the agency felt this because Samantha herself was an abused child. Samantha advised that this pregnancy was unplanned. Samantha and her boyfriend, Steve, had been together for one year. Samantha had zero prenatal care because she doesn't like doctors. Samantha advised that she and Steve are unprepared for baby, i.e. no crib, clothes, formula, etc. Samantha is unsure if they are emotionally ready. When questioned what her plans were for the baby, she responded, I don't know. The social worker sent a referral to CFS. The hospital social worker's identity has been redacted, so they will be referred to as social worker. Social worker was calling with concerns about the above-named couple's motivation and ability to parent. Samantha is 18 and gave birth to a baby girl yesterday after having no prenatal care. In talking with her, social worker was made aware that Samantha has another child that was removed from her care. When the social worker asked her why, she said that people thought she may hurt the baby just as her mother had hurt her. The social worker questioned her preparation for this baby and found out that the couple had not purchased any clothes, diapers, crib, etc. The social worker asked her if she was emotionally ready for the baby and Samantha responded by saying, I don't know. Samantha and the worker talked more about this and it became quite clear that this couple is not sure if they want to parent. Given Samantha's lack of preparation for the baby, the past concerns, and the ambivalence over parenting, the social worker is requesting workers attend sometime today to talk with mom. The social worker discussed the need to do so with Samantha, and after some hesitation agreed to meet with workers. Consulting supervisor Arthur Gwynn agreed that the evening shift should attend to the hospital today as Samantha may be able to leave tomorrow. When other social workers met with both Samantha and Steve, the couple told them that the baby was not planned and that they had not prepared for the baby at all. They were not sure if they wanted to parent the baby and asked that she be taken into the care of CFS until they were able to prepare for the baby and had decided whether or not they wanted to parent her. Social workers continued working with the couple while deciding what the future of Phoenix would be. During one visit, the social worker asked the parents to help dress Phoenix. In her report, she wrote, only Steve did so. Samantha seemed only vaguely interested in the process, and when we were walking downstairs, she seemed more interested in chatting and giggling with a friend. Over the course of the week following Phoenix's birth, Samantha and Steve decided that they did want to parent the baby. Social workers were very unsure whether or not they would be able to take care of Phoenix. One social worker noted, The writer aggressively challenged the couple on their ambivalence toward parenting this child and the lack of prenatal care the hiding of the pregnancy, and Samantha's seeming disinterest with respect to Redacted were raised as well. I can only guess that the name of Keymatch's first baby is what was Redacted. The social worker found Samantha to be very flat and stoic, writing, Complex questions often received simplistic responses, which failed to shed any meaningful light on issues, especially around why she hid this pregnancy and why she has failed to maintain any contact with Redacted. Her responses heavily consisted of shrugs and, quote, I don't know, end quote. After the death of Phoenix, audio from her interrogation and from an interview conducted after her conviction will show this to still be the case. Social workers eventually developed a plan for the parents to receive custody of Phoenix. Case Plan 1. This agency to assign a family services worker, Jarvis Office, for ongoing service and intervention. 2. 
a three-month temporary order of guardianship will be pursued. 3. This agency will await further case history from Cree Nation CNFS and incorporate same into ongoing case plan. 4. Some form of psychiatric slash psychological assessment will need to be undertaken with respect to Samantha. This to be arranged by the agency or the couple with agency approval. 5. Both parents are to commence participation in an appropriate parenting program. 6. Both parents to attend all weekly visits with Phoenix. Visits to be transferred to the Jarvis office as soon as possible. 7. Steve's CIC file may need to be reviewed should he agree to sign the appropriate consents for same. The assigned worker shall have two primary issues to sort through in the coming months. Firstly, the question of parental motivation and commitment will need to be assessed and weighed on an ongoing basis. Secondly, it will be necessary to determine Samantha's parental capacity. The preceding case plan should serve to quickly help the assigned worker with these matters so that long-term planning can quickly occur for Phoenix. Phoenix was initially put into foster care for a three-month period while CFS worked with the parents on some of the issues they saw. She was returned to Steve and Samantha on September 5th. This is where a lot of the oversight from CFS starts to fall off. CFS had a plan put together for the parents to follow, but the conditions weren't being met and CFS wasn't following up. At about the time the couple got custody of Phoenix, Samantha became pregnant again. Sinclair would later testify that they would still spend time partying, where they would leave Phoenix with one of his sisters or with his friend Kim Edwards. Edwards would testify in court that Phoenix actually spent most of her time at her house. On April 29, 2001, Samantha gave birth to a baby girl who they named Echo. Echo was three months premature and a social worker arrived to the hospital to interview the parents. The social worker determined that there was no reason that the couple couldn't take the baby home. Multiple issues would arise while Phoenix and Echo were living with their parents. Steve's sister, Angie Sinclair, was spending a lot of time with her brother and Samantha, most likely babysitting. She reported that Stephen had become violent and had assaulted both Angie and Phoenix. Keymatch and Sinclair separated sometime in the middle of 2001. CFS had received reports that Samantha had left with Echo, but then called and asked Steve to pick her up. From that time, both children were living with Steve. On July 15, 2001, Steve called 911 to report that Echo was not breathing. She was rushed to the hospital, where she was pronounced dead on arrival. Steve claimed that Echo had a cold and was running a fever. He checked on her at 7 a.m., and she was doing okay. When he checked on her again at 9.45 a.m., she was not breathing. When Samantha was notified of Echo's death, she became angry and demanded Phoenix to be given to her. The social worker told her that they would need to make a determination about custody if she wanted to take Phoenix away from Steve. She didn't understand why Steve had sole custody of Phoenix, despite the fact that she literally abandoned the girl. Over the next few years, a number of issues would put Phoenix back on CFS's radar. In February of 2003, she was admitted to the hospital with an infection that was caused by a piece of styrofoam that had gotten stuck up her nose for three months. The following June, social workers removed Phoenix from Steve's home after he had an all-day party. He was told to get alcohol treatment in order to get Phoenix back, but he never did, and Phoenix was returned to him a few months later. In December of 2003, Samantha met Carl Wesley McKay, who went by Wes. His mother was friends with Samantha's mother, and that led to Wes asking her out. She explains in the interview that she had with the Canadian Free Press. When did, how did you meet Wes? What's, your, uh, um, what's the background there? Like, how did you guys meet? Where and when? Um, I met Wes in December 2003 through my mom. Okay. And um, Did Wes know your mom? Yeah. Wes knows my mom. How? I, I don't know how they know each other, but they've known each other for years. Okay. And um, how we started going out was Wes kept coming to my mom's place, bugging me and always saying, you want to go out with me? You want to go out with me? That's what he kept saying to me all the time. And I, I didn't really want to go out with him because... I was single and I wanted to enjoy it for a while. Right. And besides, he was way older than me. 
And so we, after he kept bugging me, I just told him, yeah. And I thought maybe, well, okay, I'll give it a couple of weeks, see how it is between us. If it doesn't work out, then I'll just, you know, leave. And like how relationships always are, they're always good in the beginning, you know. Right. When Wes offered to have Samantha move in, I believe she saw it as an opportunity to have somewhere to take Phoenix. In April of 2004, Phoenix was at Kim Edwards' house, like she usually was, and Samantha showed up with her mother and wanted to take the child home with her. They let her take Phoenix, thinking she would probably bring her back in a few days, but she never did. Steve was supposed to notify social workers if Samantha asked to take Phoenix, but he didn't. On July 13, 2004, social workers visited the home of McKay and Keymatch. They saw that Phoenix was well cared for and the house was clean, so they closed the case. What they didn't do, though, was check on the person that Samantha, and now Phoenix, were living with. A search of Carl Wesley McKay would have turned up a lengthy list of charges dating back to 1991. He had three assault charges, one charge of assault with a deadly weapon, and an order of protection against his former common-law wife, only referred to as Miss X. Other files showed that the two children that McKay had with Miss X were made permanent wards of CFS on August 18, 2000. A notation in the file states, Carl Wesley McKay poses a threat to the children both directly and indirectly in terms of his propensity for violence. On November 30, 2004, Samantha gave birth to another daughter. Wes McKay was the father. She was interviewed in the hospital due to her previous involvement with CFS, but was discharged that day and allowed to go home. Despite not having seen Phoenix recently, CFS closes their case on December 7th. After Phoenix's death, many people felt that CFS had failed to protect her. An inquiry was opened in order to figure out how CFS handled the case, and many friends and family members were interviewed. Many said they were concerned with the way Phoenix was treated, especially after the new baby was born. One friend said she saw Phoenix with a bruise on her face and Samantha with a black eye. That friend also remembered seeing a lock on the door to one of the bedrooms. In April of 2005, McKay and Keymatch moved to a house north of Winnipeg. Living with them were Phoenix, the couple's baby, and one of Wes's sons from a previous relationship. That son was 12-year-old Daniel, but Wes had another 14-year-old son that would stay with them from time to time as well. After Daniel began living at the house with his dad and Samantha, he said that Phoenix was put in the basement. He testified in court that he witnessed McKay hit Phoenix with a pole, a broomstick, and a refrigerator handle. He claimed to have witnessed McKay stomp on her, shoot her with a pellet gun, and choke her until she passed out. He said that Keymatch also hit Phoenix with her fists and that the couple had both forced her to eat her own vomit. The older boy also testified in court that, during the four or five times he visited, he never saw the couple feed Phoenix, and when he tried to give her food, Samantha yelled at him. On June 11, 2005, according to McKay's son Daniel, Phoenix was beaten to death in the basement of their home. His account is that Wes McKay beat her while Samantha Keymatch sat on the stairs and watched. She would later deny that, but in Wes's interrogation, he says something similar. He refers to Keymatch as Sam. Daniel was there. Yeah. Hey, I know he was there. He was so scared. He was having a tough time with this, man. He's having a tough time with this. I don't know what I told my son, though. Yeah. I know. He was there watching this. Yeah, I know he was. I know he was. You know, it's sad about his stand there, like, I'm sorry? Sam, but you stand there, she's all fucking like, look like she's happy or shit now. Really? How come? I don't know. Yeah. She was sad. I mean, it happened. Right. How did it happen? But I don't know what the hell she said to you guys. Yeah. Well, she talked to one of the other officers. You know, Who's responsible here? You or Samantha? I don't... To me, that is both of us. It's both of you? Yes. How is it... How is it both of your fault? Explain to me. I don't know. She would always tell me to... Tell that kid to keep quiet. Okay. That day, was she telling you to keep the kid quiet? Uh, no, she was downstairs. 
I think at the beginning she was downstairs because we were going to go out. Okay. To, to go see my dad. Right. So she put her kid in the corner there. Is this in the basement? In the basement. Yeah. Okay, so she she put her kid in the basement because the kid wouldn't keep quiet? Yeah. Yeah. She, she, she's a mean mom. Right. Yeah. She has no heart. No way. It seems as though the adults had gotten angry at Phoenix about something and beat her in the basement. Then they left to go visit McKay's father. Once they were gone, Daniel went to check on Phoenix, and she wasn't breathing. Daniel called his dad and told him that Phoenix wasn't breathing, so the couple came back home. McKay claims to have performed CPR, but eventually they realized she was dead, so they dumped the body. After that, they pretended that Phoenix was still alive so they could continue claiming her as a dependent on their government assistance. They moved again in the fall of 2005, and Keymatch also became pregnant again. The baby was due in December. She was referred to CFS again, which is understandable since she has such a lengthy history with them. No file was opened because the hospital social worker believed that she had two children at home and they were all doing fine. Little did she know that one of those children was dead and buried in a shallow grave near a landfill. On February of 2006, McKay's older son told his mother that Phoenix had been killed. He said that he wasn't there, but Daniel had been. After talking to Daniel, McKay's former wife called authorities and reported what she had heard. Corporal Robert Baker of the RCMP was the lead investigator on the case. After a few days of searching records to see if Phoenix had popped up in any of their systems, two social workers went to the home of McKay and Keymatch and asked to see Phoenix. Samantha claimed that she was at her aunt's house, so the social workers asked her to meet them that afternoon at a local mall. At the mall that afternoon, Keymatch showed up with a friend's daughter and tried to pass her off as Phoenix. The social workers knew that she wasn't Phoenix, and Samantha was arrested. Wes was arrested later that day. They were taken back to be interviewed about the crime. Samantha Keymatch is interviewed by a female, and her answers are extremely quiet. In this audio, you can tell that I boosted the volume when she talks, but it makes it much easier to understand her. There's um, a couple things that we talked about that I'm a little bit confused on, though, because I, I feel like I kind of have two different stories about it, so mm -hmm. I want to make sure I got it right and get the truth about what happened, okay? The part that you and I talked about that day uh, when Phoenix died, you were telling me about what you think killed her in the basement. Um, can you explain that again? Because you explained it one part, but you had talked before about it, and it's kind of different, so I want to make sure I got it right. So I want you to talk to me about the morning, um, or the, the day that you guys were at home when Phoenix died, before you went to Wes's dad's she house. Was, she was okay. She was breathing. Okay, and I and that's what you told me, but when I had asked you about what it is when that you think came, killed her. Yeah, when we came back, I said it didn't look like she, she choked on her puke. That's what I said. That looks like me, that she might have died from choking on her puke. Right. Because there was a puke spot there. But then we talked about... What happened down there? Yeah. And that's where I'm confused, is the time when you talked about the puke, but then you also talked about Phoenix being thrown across the floor, or thrown onto the floor, banging her head. Yeah, that was the day before. Okay, so that's where I'm confused about, as what day, what thing happened. She is extremely evasive at this time. I also think she's easily confused, which will come up again when she's interviewed by the Canadian Free Press. Mm -hmm. So... The, the, like, what do you mean? The day before she died. So we, we, we know she died on June 11th, right? Mm -hmm. So on June 10th, what happened that day? What happened to her that day? Those things you were telling me about? That's the day I was pushed her. She banged her on the floor. Okay. That's what I said. She banged her head on the floor. Right. Was pushed her. See, I thought you said that that was the day that she died. No. Okay. So this is why I want to talk to make sure I've got it right. 
because there was parts that confused me about that. So on June 10th, the day before, that's when he threw her and she hit her head on the floor. Okay, so what else happened that day? Now, you had told me about hitting her in the leg a couple times with the, that bar, that pipe. I think you called it a bar, maybe? A pole. A, yeah. A pole. So did you hit her with that, that thing that day, the same day that he pushed her and she hit her head? Okay, so what day did that you hit her? a different day. I don't know what day that was, but that was a different day. I know that wasn't the day before she died. Okay. It was just a different day. It seems like all the various abuse that happened to Phoenix is getting mixed up in her head. She says that Phoenix was hit with a pole, quote, some other time that she can't remember, end quote. The 11th is when McKay beat Phoenix, so she could be getting her dates mixed up. But it ultimately sounds like she's trying to claim that nothing happened to Phoenix before they left the house to go to Wes's father's house that day. Okay, now the day that she died, you had talked about leaving with Wes to go to his dad's, mm -hmm. and then you came back because Daniel phoned because she wasn't breathing. Mm -hmm. Well, before you guys left, before you went to his dad's, what happened in the basement? I need you to talk to me about that again. Nothing happened in the basement. Like, what do you mean, like, something like, like, what do you mean, like, how it happened? Well, we talked about... There's nothing that happened. She was, she was breathing. She was all right to me when, before I left. Okay, so... She was, she was laying there, yeah, but she, she was breathing. And when you say she was laying there, where was she laying? On the floor. In the basement? Yeah. Okay, and that's the last time you saw her? Yeah. And how do you know she was breathing? Because I checked her. Okay, what, why did you think you had to check her to see if she was breathing before you left? What had happened? Because I had just, I always check on her. I just checked, it was just something like, I don't know why, I just did. Okay, because we had talked before, and you had suggested to me that Phoenix died because she choked on her puke? Mm -hmm, that might have been, I said. Okay. I don't believe that's true, and I don't think you do either. After we had talked about that, and I asked you, what do you really think killed her? And you told me that it will probably be an injury to her head. Well, yeah. Right? Yes. So when you had talked to me about how she got that injury, what day did that injury happen? On June 10th. And how do you know that? Because I remember that was the day. Because I remember thinking maybe... Maybe that's how she died, I was thinking. So I thought maybe that's how, maybe that's why she died, maybe because she had an injury to her head because maybe, because when she fell. Okay. I think other parents might agree, but maybe I'm just crazy. But I don't have a habit of checking to make sure my children are breathing before I leave the house. I definitely would feel compelled to do that if they'd just been injured somehow and were laying down. I think she got caught off guard with that. She thought she was being clever by saying, I know she was breathing because I checked her. Which brought up, why did you think that you needed to check her breathing? Uh, because I always do that. So when you said that you went to check on her... Yeah, when I checked on her, she was okay and breathing. Now she was breathing, but was she beaten up? Was she hurt? I think maybe she was hurt. Okay. I didn't... I didn't... I didn't tell like because I just wait like she was just laying there and she was breathing just like when somebody's just laying there you know, when somebody's just laying down okay so you she was okay though when I looked at her okay so she was alive you say when you looked at her now when you think she was kind of hurt what made you think she was hurt 
So I was thinking maybe, thinking maybe because of her head maybe. I was wondering about that. Okay, and so are you telling me that nothing happened in the basement that before you went, that nothing happened to her in that basement on June 11th? Because you had said before that you weren't the one that beat her. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, who beat her? And you said it was Wes. Yeah. And we were talking about that day. Mm -hmm. I said he beat her. But, but like, I said he beat her. All I want you to do, Sam, is tell me the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I didn't beat her. Okay, and I'm not saying that you did. I'm asking you to tell me the truth about what happened before you went to his dad's house that day. I don't... Yeah, I checked on her. She was okay. She was breathing. Did somebody beat her that morning? Or earlier in the day, before you went to his dad's, did somebody beat her? Like from the time we were gone and the time we got back? No. From before you went. You and Wes were still home. Daniel was there. And Phoenix was there. Before you and Wes left. Oh, yeah. I said, uh, yeah, I said Wes beat her, but I didn't say he beat her that day. I'm talking about the day before. Okay, I want to know what happened that day. That day... I think... I think that day... I think he told her to have a shower that day. That morning, I'm not sure. Unless I'm thinking of another day. She's playing a game here, where she claims that she didn't beat her, then says she was breathing. When asked if something happened before she left, she says, I didn't beat her. When she's asked, did Wesley beat her? She was breathing when I left. Did something happen to her before that? She says, between the time we left and the time we got back? No! This has to be the most patient investigator on the planet. But ultimately, they don't get any answers out of her. So that when you got home, what is the first thing you did when you got back home? Went downstairs. And what did you see when you went down there? She was laying there. Where in the basement was she laying? On the floor. Okay, so you went downstairs and she's laying on the floor. Um, how was she laying? She was laying on, she was laying on her, her back. Okay, did she have any clothes on? No? So when you guys went down there and you found her naked laying on her back, is that when you said that Wes tried CPR? Okay, and then that's when it got into where you went to get garbage bags and you guys wrapped her and we talked about that already. We talked about stuff like that already, yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing we haven't talked about that... Sorry, go ahead. But we, we did, like, like I told you, we didn't wrap her up right away. We didn't wrap her up. Well, wasn't no. So, how long did you wait to wrap her up? I, t I told you already. Like I think you said before it was maybe a couple hours, right? Yeah. It was, it was something that wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't. The most emotion she shows is being frustrated at being asked a question that she's already answered. From what Daniel testified, Keymatch didn't cause the physical damage that killed Phoenix, but she sat by and let her daughter get beat to death. From what witnesses have said, it's possible that she instigated the beating, and now she's being intentionally evasive while being questioned about it. 
She will later say in an interview that all of the abuse was from Wes, and she did nothing but love Phoenix. If that's true, why is she covering for him now? They're both under arrest, and she could easily say, yes, Wes beat her in the basement before we went to his father's house. But instead, she plays dumb and tries to protect him. About the same time, McKay is being interrogated by a different investigator. This guy has a different tactic, which is to blow a lot of smoke up his ass. He tells Wes over and over again that he's a good guy and that he had values and that's why he's going to get this off his chest. It's hard to listen to, but it works. He softens Wes up and gets way more information out of him than the other investigator got out of Samantha. I tried to save her. Yeah, what'd you do? I tried to give her CPR. Yeah. And what happened? She put a cup to No. That must have been hard, eh? It must have been hard. He focuses a lot on coming home and trying to revive Phoenix. He repeats that he gave her CPR a number of times and says that he put her in the bathtub and ran some water on her. How, what, what was it that set you off that day? I mean, we all have pressures in our life, okay? Was it, was it medication? Was it stress? Was it people bothering you? Was it fear? Was it, what was it that set you off? I'm sorry, I don't know, I just... I don't know, it's, it's such a... It's, it's a tragic thing. It is a tragic thing, but you're taking a first step, right? As I said earlier, today is the first day of the rest of your life, right? Okay? It's important for you, and you know what? Your family will see it as like, wow, he's, he took ownership of this. He didn't try and hide. When did this happen? Hmm. When did this happen? You probably remember the date. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking back here. Yeah, what my mother said. Yeah, take your time. She says, try not to get too involved in this relationship with Samantha. Yeah. How come? She was right. How come? She, because she knows, she knows her mom. Okay, your mom knows Samantha's mom? Samantha's mom. Yeah, yeah. who's that? Uh, her name is Bertha. Yeah, okay. You ship and shoulder her or no, behind? I'm here, no big. Yeah. Okay. So there's some stress is going on in your life, right? It was uh you know, when when my, I first told her to come and stay with me and Right. You know, I didn't even know she had a, had a kid. You know. Oh, you didn't know Samantha? No, I didn't know she had a kid. Oh really? Okay. Next thing you know, you know, she I go to her mom's and her kid's there and Right. And, is that Phoenix you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that this was her kid but she was staying with her mom right you know i thought myself first time that samantha was uh, just single i didn't know she had any kids and right i don't know she she wasn't very uh, i don't know she wasn't very good with her child anyway samantha wasn't no no how come i don't know i just don't know maybe the anger in her or something yeah then she get me and you know tell her to shut that's not like, Tell her to sh shut the hell up, put right. it in the corner, or whatever. Right. There was always Samantha starting with this kid. You know, the biggest mistake was this. I mean, I can't say that she moved in the kid. The kid was like a mistake. Right. You no, know, she should have stayed with her grandparents. You know, and I, I just lived this life of me, her, and it, you know, when when I found out she was pregnant, you know, that shocked me. And yeah, I. Uh, I tried so hard to, you know, you know, keep her happy. Right. You know, uh, but this tra tragedy has totally uh, turned my life. I bet it has. It must be weighing thin on your nerves, eh? Since then? Oh, well, it's, I don't know, it's, uh... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of been bugging you. It has been. Yeah. It's, yeah, every night. It's interesting that McKay is very open about Keymatch being abusive, and at least partially to blame for the death of Phoenix. It's almost the opposite of her interrogation. So, tell me, explain to me how it happened. I can't remember. Just... Try and remember for me, okay? I can't remember this, uh... I can't hear you. I don't even remember this. We just... I'm not fucking, she put her in the corner, and she, I don't know what the fucking, she came out of the corner. And then Phoenix. I, yeah. Yeah. And I grabbed it, I threw her on, on the clothes, 
there's a bag of clothes I threw on there. And says, you know, listen to your mom. I said, so I, we went and left. And then Daniel called me. She said that this little girl was breathing anymore. Yeah. I came back to the house and I said, Yeah, I know you did. That's what Daniel said. And she said, Did I revive her? Yeah. But it didn't work. And then we were scared. I bet you were. Then I told her. And then she said, Let's this, this, go bury her somewhere. Okay. Right, we know that. <laughs> so we were after up and we went. We buried her. Yeah. Where'd you bury her? In the bush somewhere. Where? By the garbage dump. Yeah. Are you talking about uh, which garbage dump? I don't know. Somewhere, you, if you go up the road somewhere. It's in the what garbage dump? dump? And when you go towards on the, I don't know if it's the south side or something, you have to go up the road. Who, who all went when you went to bury the child? Just me and Sam went. Yeah. What happened to Daniel? I told him to stay home. Yeah. I told him to move back. Yeah. So, Trini explained to me, you said you buried, how deep is the body buried? It wasn't very deep. If you were to say in inches, how deep? Probably like a foot, foot and a half. What you use to, to bury? But I used a shovel. Yeah. What, um, what did you... Did you put the baby into anything? What's that? Did you put the, the child into anything? Plastic. Where'd you get the plastic from? It was downstairs. It was for the, for the walls. Yeah. Okay. How, what vehicle did you use when you got out there? It's my car. Is that the temple? Yeah. Yeah? Where'd you place the child in the car? In the, in the trunk. In the trunk? What time of day was this? This is in the evening. About what time? It was starting to get dark. Yeah? About nine, it was ten. Yeah. Did you ever go back there? No. You didn't go back and look? No. Is the body still there? I don't know. Well, if you didn't go back, would it still be there? I don't know. Is there anything on top of it right now? Just soil, I guess. How about snow? Snow, yeah, there'd be snow on here, I guess. What direction in the dump? Is it right in the dump or is it on the outside? No, it's on the dump in, in a bush somewhere. Okay. You'd be able to take me there? Yeah. Yeah? Really? Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. I just want this over. I know you do. I know you do. And you know what? You're doing a good thing. I know you do. You're doing a good job. I know. I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail. Hey. Hey. Let's worry about dealing with the stuff right now, okay? All right? Okay? Right? When asked what happened, he gives a fairly complete description of what happened that day and what they did with her body. He agrees to take the police to the spot where they buried her, which he does. They captured the event on video. All right, uh, it is uh, about 9.51 p.m. We're out at the uh, location. Um, Carl Wesley McKay is, uh, is going to take us exactly to where uh, Phoenix Sinclair is buried. It's in here, or right in here. I know it's in here somewhere. Okay. So at that point, we're, we're standing there. Where the light is? Right around here. Okay. Okay. So you've marked this spot yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, so, and can you mark where else it's going to be? Okay. Well, it's like, oh, because I had a small light right here. <coughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Now is that the other spot? This might be the spot, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, because that looks a little deeper in. Okay. And I, I'm pretty sure I was about here. Yeah? How far off the trail? It wasn't very far off the trail here. Yeah. Because there's another trail right here. Okay. And we're, yeah, I think it was this spot here. Okay. Right in here. All right. So it's either going to be there or there. Which spot is it going to be? I think most likely here. Most likely? Yeah. I'm pretty sure I didn't go into it. Like if we're talking percent, how, how sure are you? About, about 99 percent. Yeah? Yeah, because yeah, this is too deep. In. Okay. And where in there um, Approximately is, is Phoenix Sinclair? Right this way. Okay. And exactly where in there? Okay. How far in the ground? How far in the ground will she be? 
approximately about three inches. About eight ten inches? Ten inches. Okay. The soil on the top. Yeah. The foot, right here. So that deep? So that deep, yeah. Okay. All right. <coughs> and uh, did anybody help you uh, burying Phoenix and Claire? Uh, myself and Samantha. Okay. Samantha. He met. All right. Okay. Is, is there anything else you want to say while we're here? You, this is your time. Yeah. Uh, I've done this for the Phoenix to recover her body. Okay. Because she deserves a proper burial. And I've done it for my, my boys as well as myself. And Samantha. All right. Okay. Anything else you want to say? I'm what? Really sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cause you guys, because I know you're. It's your job, and you shouldn't be out here, and Phoenix should be out wow. roaming. Well, we'll get, we'll get her up. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that's about it. I, uh, just how, how will we find her in there? How will she be? She will be face up. The, uh, the plastic uh, is, uh, I wrap her in plastic with a yellow uh, rain jacket. Her head being covered with the head part, and the rest of her body will break. Okay. Is, is there any markings on the ground, so indicators? No indicators because we just put her right by, right here. This, I think, I believe it's right here. I, I'm 100% sure now because I know. You're 100%? Yes. Okay. Because that was all water. Here. What? Like, uh, like, uh, Wes, which way? Do you know, or can you recall which way her head or her, he, head, her feet her head, would be pointing? Her head here. Her head's here, okay. and then down. Okay. Where are her, her feet? Her feet are here, and her head's right here. And is there anything else in there with her at all? Just the dirt will be covered with. Okay. Uh, the, the, like I said, the the uh, the grave was about this wide, because she's a very, a very small girl. So it's about this wide. We're going to find her. Once the trial began, the couple blamed each other for the death of Phoenix Sinclair. They were both found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. An inquiry was conducted to examine the circumstances that led to the death of Phoenix Sinclair. The inquiry was issued in 2014 as a three-volume report that concluded that child welfare fundamentally misunderstood its mandate to protect children and left Phoenix defenseless against her mother's cruelty and the sadistic violence of the woman's boyfriend. After the trial, the Canadian Free Press ran a story about the case that described Samantha Keymatch as saying she killed her kid, to which she took offense and asked the writer, Mike McIntyre, to meet her so she could set the record straight. I take it you had some things you wanted to, to say? Um, I just, like, I wanted to know, like, well, I read yesterday, yesterday's article yeah and like wh why did you print that like first the first thing was she killed her kid like right. that was the first line of this of the article and I just like got I don't know like angry about it because there is no she killed her kid of course the jury has found that you killed your kid, um, they didn't find you not guilty of murder. Um, I mean, you're right, they found, you. their finding is that you both killed the phoenix. See, but that's the thing, like, there is no they, us, or we in this about killing her, like how people are saying, or how he's saying too. She has it in her head that since McKay is the one who physically inflicted the abuse that killed Phoenix, she can't also be considered someone who killed her. So are you saying that, that Wes did absolutely everything to her? You never laid a hand on her? Or are well, you admitting that you, you abused her? I didn't abuse my own child. Like, there's a difference between telling your kid to, like, you know, like, go to bed or something, you know, than abusing your child. Like, like a little, like a little push to like get going, you know, kind of type of thing. That's like, I don't really see how that could be abuse. But that's a far cry from what 
the boys see, testified about. See, that's what I mean. That never happened. That's it. You know, like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, like I said, I'm not good at explaining things. But. Why would they, they were testifying against their own father, which would be hard enough. Like, but, and they, they certainly told of horrible things that he did to Phoenix. But why would they make stuff up about you and not him? See, like, that's what I don't understand. Like, there is stuff that they have said that wasn't true. Was Phoenix I, made to sleep in the basement? Was she made to sleep in the basement? Yeah, naked on the floor. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say she was made to sleep in a basement. Did she sleep in the basement? Well, what you tell me? What do you think? What is your? Well, what is your? I mean, uh, the the evidence to me went in pretty clearly that these things happened. That Phoenix. His head was shaved. That Her head became... wasn't shaved. Her head wasn't shaved. It wasn't? No, it wasn't. Phoenix had hair. We've heard about, you know, the boys described hearing her crying through the vents at night from the basement. They described trying to give her food. Grab trying to give her food. She ate. Phoenix ate. I would feed her. Wes would feed her. She ate. She didn't starve. Was she beaten? All the that evidence that doesn't come from any witnesses. That comes from the doctors who testified about all these broken bones. Um, obviously, some very serious injuries happened to her. Ones that you must have known about as, as her mother and as someone who was with her. How would you not know your child has that kind of injury? Like I told you, I tried to stop Wes from doing things to her. But how did you try and stop them? Like I, I tried to get her like out of his way. I, I would even take a beating so that she wouldn't take it. Like nobody like... I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. But wouldn't the wouldn't the best way to protect her have been to get her out of that house, to call the police on Wes, to take her to a hospital? Mm -hmm. Yeah, would have. It would have been like if I could change like all of this from happening. I would have. I would do it in a second to have this all changed. She's disputing what was said about her in court, but when she's directly asked a question, she doesn't answer. Was she forced to sleep on the floor in the basement? She responds, I wouldn't say that she was forced to sleep in the basement. And when asked if she slept in the basement at all, she said, what do you think? And what about the concealing, uh, the bearing of the body, of course? We've heard from some witnesses that... Um, you had talked about some programs you watched and ideas you had from things you'd seen on TV about how to cover up the scent of a body, throwing pepper in the grave. Who said I threw pepper in the grave? Well, I don't think, not specifically that you threw pepper in the grave, but that you had talked about seeing that on TV uh, on some shows. Wait, who said that? The names escape me right now, but it was the there were those couple witnesses, people that had been watching TV with you one night, and you guys got to talking about burying a body, and there was talk about how it would be done if it was done. And then I know Wes certainly said in his statement that you had talked about some things with Phoenix specifically, including that you wanted to go and cut the head off. Oh my goodness. I don't know why anybody would believe anything that Wes says. But wouldn't he likely say much the same about you though? Don't you think? Like, don't you guys get it? Like, like, don't you guys understand? Like, 
I just I get so frustrated because you guys like don't understand what I think the one of the problems I, here how can you understand a case like this it's it's to me it's beyond comprehension on many many levels you know, I like, can't understand what happened to Phoenix don't you guys get it don't you understand that I'm the one telling the truth and you should believe everything I say? If that's the case, then every single person she knew lied about her. I get that McKay would lie to make himself look less guilty, but his son, her friends, the medical examiner, that would be a pretty decent-sized conspiracy. But you heard the case that it was not only acts of commission, or things that you do, but acts of omission as well, and omission being things that weren't done. And, of course, we can't ask the jury exactly what they found. You can't talk to them. But it's, it's possible that they found more on you that it was acts of omission. Like, that you didn't do things that you should have to protect Phoenix, that uh, any parent should, like, should do. Like, what do you mean? Like, so... Like saying, saying what that? Well, that you're guilty by your inactions, by the fact you didn't stop this, that you didn't get your daughter help, that you didn't get her out of there. So, is, uh, so what is that? Is that trying to make Wes look like he's? Well, I'm saying they they may have found that Wes did the majority of the abuse on her, but well, he did do the abuse on her. But at the same time... And I told you I tried to stop it. But I think... It's not like I just stood there and said, Oh, okay, Wes, go ahead, do that to her, and I'll just stand here and watch. It wasn't like that. I think most parents would say that faced with a situation where they're watching their child's life being taken away, they would, they would sacrifice their own life. They would do absolutely everything possible to save that child. And you can't honestly sit here and say you did everything to save Phoenix, because if you said, I mean, if you did, she'd still be alive. Like I told you, like I, I don't know how, I don't know, you know, you know, like I don't know. I, I, I kind of feel like I can't even really t tell you anything. Like tell me whatever you want. Uh, I'm, I kind of feel like you're trying to, like I don't know. I'm not here to judge you. That was what the jury did. I'm here to listen to you. Like, I don't know. I kind of feel like you're trying to switch things. I'm certainly not painting Carl McKay or Wes McKay to be a saint in this. Not at all. He's convicted as he... Well, of course uh, he is no as saint. As the evidence showed that, that Wes, he should have been. Wes knows I didn't kill my kid, and he knows I didn't abuse my kid. He knows that I love my kid. This is the part where it's clear that she doesn't understand why she was found guilty. She thinks, he physically killed her, I didn't. He's guilty, I'm not. She doesn't understand the gray area of her putting Phoenix in that position, not protecting her, and covering up the crime. And then, since he's not agreeing with everything she's saying, now he's against her as well. She's definitely more concerned with how she's being perceived than the fact that her daughter is dead. And and the part in the, in, in the column there that you wrote yesterday about being emotionless. Right. Um, like, can you explain like why? You well, saw you saw you saw the jury, right? A lot of them were crying. You saw, I'm sure, a lot of people in the in the gallery were crying. The police officer. Um, and I was watching you, and I think a lot of people were watching you, and I didn't see any tears. Um, I just saw someone sitting there with a pretty blank look on their face. Now, I don't know what to make of that, but to me, that's emotionless. Like, like I know you guys can sit there and, and think that I have no feelings or anything about what's going on. Like, everybody shows their emotions in different ways. Like, not everybody cries when something happens. Like, for me, like, I'm the type of person to, like, hold my, my tears back. Right. Like, yeah, like, when I'm sitting in the courtroom, yeah, I do get watery eyes, like, and I try not to, 
let the teardrops fall because I'm the person that doesn't like to cry in front of people. Right. But so, if ever there was going to be a time... And I have cried in court. I have. But, and when I have cried, it's because I turned away and I would wipe my tears so that you guys wouldn't see, like I said. Mm -hmm. I, well, what, was, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind as you heard um, Kim Edwards read the victim impact statements, as you heard and saw the jurors and... When, when Kim read the statements, I felt like sad. I felt, I felt hurt and um, I don't know, I did have watery eyes. I just, like I said, I'm just like not really the type to mm -hmm. cry in front of people. Like I try to hold that back from people seeing. I know this is said a lot in true crime. Someone has a loved one die, and when police interview them, they don't think they showed enough emotion. That husband wasn't sad enough about his wife dying. That mother wasn't crying enough about her child dying. Everyone handles grief differently. The problem I have with her emotional response is that it was never there. From the time Phoenix was born, she never showed an interest in her. From testimony in court and records from the hospital staff, everybody claimed that she was completely indifferent to her daughter. I don't think she ever had an emotional attachment to Phoenix. So with that in mind, I'm not surprised that she looked unemotional in court, but I also find it hard to believe that she was really loving to her daughter. I think she didn't feel much of anything about Phoenix, which made it easier to be complicit with the abuse she was suffering at the hands of McKay. Just the one other thing, I know they want this room right away, so I'll be really quick, but the one other thing I wanted to ask you about, there was it, three months before this happened, when CFS came to your door investigating some kind of tip, and you answered the door and didn't let them in to see Phoenix. Why was that? Three months before this. Yeah, in March of 2005. Remember when they came, the worker testified about coming there, and then you wouldn't let them in, and then they closed the file after that. They never did see Phoenix, but they, they saw rain, and you were at the door, and you told them that they couldn't come in. Why was that? Why was that? Yeah. Like, why couldn't they come in? Why, why didn't you let them see Phoenix? Like... Like they, they wanted to check up on her, and you didn't let them, and then they closed the file, which I don't understand why they did I that. I don't like CFS. I don't like CFS. And right. But they were there in Phoenix's interests. I don't remember. I don't think. Like, I'll have to... Yeah, that was in, it came out during the trial in March of 05. Somebody called to say something about Phoenix, so they went to check on her at your place on McGee, and the worker testified that she came to the door, you answered the door, they saw rain, and rain was fine, but they were there to see Phoenix, and you said that they couldn't come in, and so they left, and then they closed the file, and they never came back again. And uh, a lot has been asked about why it happened that way, why... What if they would have seen her that day? Could this have all have been avoided? Would they have seen injuries on her? I'll have to recheck on that, like what was said, because yeah, um, okay. Oh, I can't answer that right now. So I'll have to re sure. see what was okay. I grew up in a household with domestic abuse, and I know that there are situations where people are cut off from their families and threatened into believing that they can't get away from their abuser. It just doesn't feel like that was the case here. People that were friends with her claimed that she was not a good mother. I know that Daniel was McKay's son, but I agree with Mike McIntyre. It doesn't make sense for him to testify about his father beating his stepsister to death and then pepper in some lies about Keybatch also being abusive. In her interrogation, she talks about hitting Phoenix with a pole. Now, you had told me about hitting her in the leg a couple times with the, that bar, that pipe. I think you called it a bar, maybe? A pole. A, yeah. A pole. So did you hit her with that, that thing that day, the same day that he pushed her and she hit her head? Okay, so what day did that you hit her? That was a different day. 
I don't know what day that was, that was a different day. I know that wasn't the day before she died. So the I never abused her claim doesn't pass the smell test. Of course, after the interview, Mike McIntyre wrote an article about it, which prompted McKay and his lawyer to request a meeting so they could make a rebuttal. Unfortunately, this was recorded in a prison and there's some sort of alarm going off in the background. It was just for her to say that she's in an abusive relationship, that, you know, I'm the one that's, that's the mean guy. She's just, trying to, she's just trying to clear her name because of the fact that she got charged for first degree murder on a child, on her own child. So you figure she's gonna, she wants to clear her name because whatever happens in jail, and maybe that's possibly what's gonna happen to me too, you know, that's a big question mark. On the point of there was saying there's no abuse, um, obviously your record is your record, and you can't deny you do have a record of abusing women. Yeah. Loretta, um, and then I believe there was another but if you look woman at after Loretta that didn't testify in court, but that there's some abuse there as well. If you look at the the many years ago that, that this happened, you know, people change, people change overnight. But, like it's been with Loretta, like 15 years, and the other one, you know, like 10 years or so, that's, that's a long time. I mean, people change. And you were and, a drinker back then. And I was a drinker back then, yes, I gotta admit, you know, um, I had many binge blackouts type of thing, but, uh, you know, I, it was just, it, that was then and this is now. You know, I, I quit drinking. I, I was, uh, I was, uh, had, had a good job, of course. And I was starting my own business, which, uh, which is consulting uh, native trucking companies in Manitoba. <laughs> McKay is trying to say that he changed and is no longer abusive. Bullshit. People said he still drank pretty recently and that he had a temper. People don't build the record he had over multiple spouses and then just stop being an abuser. The day of Phoenix's death, I should have listened to my heart and not Sam. I wanted to call someone like the hospital, someone. But Sam says, no, we'll lose Rain and Daniel. I did, I did do CPR on her mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, chest compressions, and even took her to the bathtub and put her in warm water, continuing CPR. It was too late, and Sam, with no feelings, oh, she's dead. No tears, nothing. She says on the interview with Free Press, what did you do to her? I love her. That's a bunch of BS. A little dramatic, isn't it? She wouldn't win an Oscar, for, that's for sure. You know, she's trying to paint herself like a good person, like a good mother, mother of the year thing, you know. She's not, she's a very evil, uh, controlling. And she was saying that I was controlling. Unfortunately, especially for Phoenix, this whole case is no longer about her to either Key Match or McKay. This is about them trying to look better than the other one. And the worst part is, it doesn't matter. They both caused the death of Phoenix Sinclair. The jury found them both guilty, and they will both be in prison for at least 25 years. Due to the inquiry that was conducted because of this case, the government is working to expand the authority of Manitoba's children's advocacy. Thank you for listening to Monsters. For more stories of the worst people on the planet, you can visit our blog at thisismonsters.com.